All right, my teacher friends. So today I'm going to show you another alternative to grading. So in other videos, I've contested that I think that one of the most futile things we do as English teachers um, is participate in our traditional grading methods. So typically, as we know, we assign an essay, kid arduously works on it, submit it. We begrudgingly sit on it for a couple of weeks and then we build up the gumption to finally grade and we give up our evenings and weekends scrawling comments into the margins of their papers. We return them and most of the kids don't even look at our comments. They look at the grade and say, yeah, I love this teacher. Or, oh, this teacher is such a jerk. They hate me, right? So they take it very, they think our grades are very subjective and personal uh, oftentimes. So Believe it or not, much of um, my work as far as my templates, my heuristics, my alternative grading practice uh, are rooted in the philosophies of Bob Ross. And back in graduate school, I was working with Theodore Sizer and he turned to me one day and he said, what kind of composition teacher do you want to become? And my question to him was, I said it kind of flippantly, was, you know, what would, what would composition look like if Bob Ross were to teach it? And it ended up becoming a very serious uh, pursuit of mine because, you know, one of the things that I was seeing in my practicums was the huge difference between the assigning of writing and the teaching of writing. So I've given this example in my other videos, and I'll give it again in case it's new, and it also probably merits repeating. So when Bob Ross comes onto the screen and he says, hello, happy little people, today we're going to paint a beautiful New England autumnal landscape with beautiful fall foliage, and in the center of our canvas, we're going to include a New England wood-covered bridge. He does not proceed, you know, by giving out a graphic organizer and then kind of milling around the room uh, for the period or two that the kids are assigned to do the painting, uh, putting out classroom management fires, or nor does he sit at the desk and, um, you know, just kind of work on something else while students are, uh, you know, cranking a paper. He teaches it because what I just described is assigning he sits at the easel, he sits at the canvas, and he walks us through step by step. And here's something about Bob Ross that most people don't know. He used one template. He called it a heuristic. So he used one heuristic uh, every single time he engaged in a painting, and it was called the wet on wet technique. And one of the things I do when I uh, give my student a writing task is tell them there's one template for the introductory paragraph and one template for the body paragraphs. So for this alternative grading method, I'm going to give a quick preview and a rundown of some of my uh, templates and then show you how I can accelerate a grading process while putting the onus on the student. And one of the things that I'll say throughout this video is this. In traditional grading practices, 99.9% .9 of the onus is on the teacher. We own everything. All the comments, the grade, uh, the labor is all on our shoulders. And one of the things that uh, Theodore Sizer said to me in my practicum as my mentor teacher was this. He said, if you are ever outworking your students, the whole paradigm is wrong and uh, it's not responsible teaching. So in my alternative grading methods, uh, students have greater accountability and they have greater buy-in and ownership in the process above and beyond reading our comments or not reading our comments and simply looking at a grade. That's We're not asking them to do enough and that's one of the reasons why they don't grow and mature as writers. So in other videos that I've posted on YouTube, I talk about how I establish a common language with my students, um, but also how I, you know, um, teach them basic skills like grammar, punctuation, syntax, and then exercises on how to achieve voice rhythm and flow. So get into my YouTube channel, probably a good idea to subscribe and um, 
check out those videos because those are going to be essential knowings for students in order to use my alternative grading practices. So one of the texts that I use to teach all of that stuff is Write It Right by Strunk and White. It's a free uh, textbook. You can just type in Write It Right with Strunk and White PDF. Um, it's a uh, Kind of a second edition of the elements of style which many of us probably used uh, growing up learning these skills and i've just developed activities around the textbook and if you're familiar with my work you know that i gamify a lot of instruction so this just allows me to have a shared language uh, with the students uh, so that I can accelerate my grading process. So one of my videos I talked about um, how I teach grammar, punctuation, syntax. And this is just one way. So I do something called the five sentences of the day early in the academic year until we get mastery of this. And I give the students five sentences that contain no punctuation. And as teams, they have to fill in all the blanks with the semicolons, the colons, the colons, the hyphens, the periods, et cetera. And it's very similar to my Plato's Plato discussion. And as you can see here for this one, um, we use a Hungry Hippos um, game in order to get through these five sentences. And it only takes literally about six, seven minutes to get through uh, five sentences. So it doesn't uh, consume a great deal of class time. And uh, as I've said in my other videos, I have 86 minute blocks. So um, I can uh, have a lot of transitions in my class. So just sentences like, it's ironic, but smiling a lot can actually cause wrinkles. I guess it pays off to be depressed. So kids just work through that sentence together, punctuate it correctly, and uh, in terms of gamifying it, uh, there's points received, points deducted, uh, a nice competitive collaborative team effort in order to learn punctuation, grammar, and syntax. So um, there's videos on that. So another thing that I do in order to teach nuance and voice rhythm and flow, it comes from the Strunk and White manual, and they assert that there's 12 different ways to construct a sentence. So when I'm talking about voice rhythm and flow in my alternative grading methods, I refer to what Strunk and White call rule number 18. And there's a lot of exercises that I do um, until my students have relative mastery of this concept. And you've probably noticed in my student samples, my students are pretty good with uh, manipulating their syntax. Not all of them master it, but they definitely make progress. And it helps them out whether or not they're taking an exam or not. Uh, I do it with my general ed students as well and uh, make some more college ready, real world ready. So there are exercises uh, for that that, uh, that I do um, that also accelerate my grading. Again, it's all about common language. So this is a game that uh, I do for those sentence structures. So every single sentence is a short, simple declarative sentence. And my students have to revise it, manipulating the 12 sentence constructs. It's a team game. Uh, it's Hollywood Squares. Uh, I can send this PowerPoint to you if you want. I also have a video on it. But just look at all the sentences here. So in how it reads, I have many flaws. One is that I judge people, people who push their carts slowly at Wegmans bug me. I also can't stand old people who write checks. I'm pretty judgmental. So you might smile at that and say, yes, I have students that write exactly like that. And that's the thing, our struggling emerging writers typically only use two or three of the 12 sentence constructs. So we gotta break them of that habit um, otherwise, they're just going to kind of plateau very early in the academic year and not make progress. And we're just going to get frustrated with um, the oversimplified manner in which they write. So this all can be taught. And uh, it's just uh, some exercises. Um, I do a blend of straight up academic worksheets and handouts and then gamification. So here's something else that I'll talk about in this particular um uh, alternative grading method. I'm going to focus on my students to be verbs. 
I find that uh, when they use an excessive amount of to be verbs, it yields a very passive language. Uh, it um, really hampers their diction. They, they use a lot of tier one vocabulary, which is just your basic, basic, basic vocab. And then they overuse that short, simple declarative sentence construct. So students can monitor that by looking at how many to be verbs they're using. And the to be verbs are was, were, am, is, been, be, been, are. So again, you gotta practice that. You just can't talk about it in the ether. So I do, uh, again, some gamification with that. So I give them sentences that contain a lot of to be verbs and they have to revise it, getting all the to be verbs out. So here's an example. The Beatles used to be my favorite band. But now I'm giving modern groups a chance because I've been being more open-minded. So you can see in this simple sentence, you have be, am, been, and being. You have four to be verbs. So the goal of the student is to get rid of them all. So this is a revision. In the past, comma, I pretty much only listened to the Beatles, comma, but lately more modern groups and musicians have found their way into my rotation. So you can see here the sentence complexity changes, the vocab goes up, and it's one way to get um, rid of the passive voice, but also to achieve be better rhythm and flow. So we'll look at uh, to be verbs um, in student drafts in just a second. So it's just, it's the benefits of using templates and the, the acquisition of these basic skills that give us a shared language during our writing workshops when we're grading work and appraising work. So I'll give you an example. The other day in my 11th grade general ed class, um, a student volunteered to have their body paragraph projected onto the screen. And we have 24 students in that class, so there were 24 sets of eyes, 25 including mine, and we had tore apart Jason's work. He wanted feedback on it so that um, he could revise and get a higher grade. He was just like, I'm so tired of scoring low 80s all the time. I, I really want to get my grade up, so what can I do better? And one of the things I told him based on an observation that a student made was that he had four short simple declarative sentences back to back to back to back and that it was very chop 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 in terms of the flow and i told him i said why don't you take sentences two and three and turn it into a parenthetical statement and he knew exactly what I was talking about. And he's not a really good writer. Well, I, I, I can't say that. He's not an exceptionally good writer uh, in my class. He struggles. He tends to be in the C, in the 70 range, low B minus, 80 range. So he struggles a little bit and he's emerging. He's making progress. But that made sense to him. And I was able to talk at that level with him. So the first question in terms of the templates is, how do I write my introductory paragraph? And I've gone over this in a lot of my videos, so I'm going to fly through it here. So you got two options. You have two templates. You can declare the thesis or invert the thesis. So if you declare the thesis, you're going to begin with the thesis. Just declaratively, boom, drop the thesis in the first sentence. Then you provide context and background. I like the students to establish an academic tone, so I want to see tier two level vocabulary in it. And what I mean by that is your average run of the mill SAT level word. And then I want to focus on the sentence constructs. And always, 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 as students are using my templates, the introductory paragraph is going to be four sentences long, no more, no less, exactly four. And then when they kick off the training wheels and get rid of the scaffold, they can make decisions as authors as to how many they need to be sufficient in order to anchor, to get anchored in the thesis statement. If you invert, you just flip it. So you're going to end with a thesis. So the thesis is the fourth sentence. Context, background, tier two, sentence constructs, four sentences. So it doesn't necessarily matter. So as we're grading papers, I, I can really hone in on the specificity of what an introduction should look like and what I'm looking at in terms of nuance, mechanics, theory, technique, basics in an introductory paragraph. Um, instead of trying to isolate what I'm looking at, um, uh, it's too much uh, if they're not using templates. We really, we really can't hone in on specific things. So body paragraphs, we're going to tackle syllogistically. And again, in many of my other videos, I go over this. 
but basically in brief, it's just um, when you're arguing from premise, premise, conclusion uh, is what a syllogism is. It's from the Aristotelian tradition. And um, in order to establish a line of reasoning in the body paragraph, I have my students argue syllogistically. So here's an example. If I were to say premise one, arsenic is deadly. Premise two, my dog ate arsenic. In the conclusion, you would naturally conclude because of the line of reasoning that your dog is going to die. So we want students to write that cogently in their body paragraphs. Um, in terms of the template, my, my students' body paragraphs, uh, they're shooting for 10 sentences so that there's enough textual support and analysis. Hard cap at 12. So let's talk about this particular alternative grading method. In order to make this work, I do something called Bob Rossing my instruction, and I kind of alluded to it in the beginning. When I work with teachers um, and push into districts and work with English departments or do my mastermind, I really emphasize with, with teachers that you have to be the expert writer in your classroom and provide your students with tons of models and exemplars uh, in order for this to work. You have to write with your students, just as Bob Ross paints with his students, right? In order to become a better painter, you have to show up week every Saturday morning, show up with Bob Ross, with your canvas, your easel, your paints, your brushes, and paint with them. And if you do it week after week after week, you're going to become a pretty adept painter. And the same goes for our student writers. They need to show up with us, and we need to paint with them. And again, that's the difference between assigning writing and the direct teaching of it. So Bob Ross, your instruction, and it's really going to pay off. So this alternative grading method, um, what I do is I went to Walmart and I bought my kids a box of 25 cent Korans. So I didn't have to break bank on this. And through the absence and presence of color, they're going to see exactly what they did with regards to their particular essay. So in terms of organization and structure, what they do is this. They finish their essay, they submit it to me. And I just read the essays. I don't put any comments on them at all. And in my notebook, I write down the grade I think they deserve. And that's it. That's all I do. The next class, they come in. They get their essays back and their box of crayons. And what we do is I'll project a few essays anonymously just to model how to um, color code the essays and how to work through the alternative grading method. Some of the exemplars are mine because I don't want to embarrass students, so I'll intentionally write some lacking uh, papers or introductions or paragraphs, transitions, etc. And uh, we'll just go through it. So every little nuance aspect of my template gets discussed during this alternative grading method. And look how I can hone in. Look at how the students can hone in on the specifics and see exactly what is going on in terms of the good, the bad, the ugly with regards to their writing. So I have very focused directions here. And again, we, do, we go over it in, in, in class during our writing workshop. So I'll be posting uh, or projecting things onto the board to model how to do this. Um, and we just start with the introduction. So students are looking at their introductions in comparison to other students' introductions. And ultimately, what happens is this. The uh, template for the inverted and declarative uh, work well for particular expository modes. So for literary analysis, students want to invert. For rhetorical analysis, students want to declare. In argument, persuasion, and synthesis, it's a 50-50 split. So let's say that we're working on a literary analysis. So the kids have re read um, A Raisin in the Sun or House on Mango Street or something like that. So they have to invert. So what I'm going to do is show the kids a couple of declarative and show them how it does not work if you declare because it's going to yield plot analysis. Uh, and probably not have a thesis because it's so plot heavy versus inverted. And I'm going to tell them with your crayons, open it up. If you wrote a declarative, underline it in red. If you wrote an inverted, underline it in green. Red means stop, green means go. If you got red, 
you're going to have to rewrite your introduction because you probably don't have a thesis statement. It's going to read like a cliff note summation. And I remind students that the demand of the assignment is to write write and perform literary analysis, not plot analysis. So it breaks students of that habit and gets them really disciplined. So in terms of the nuanced stuff uh, that we look for, I give them directions like this. Maintaining an academic tone is important. Underline each tier two level word that you used in your essay in purple. All right, so they're going to go through. I'll model what tier two is for them and underline something that I wrote and they'll go through. So the absence and presence of color. If they have a decent amount of purple, they know that they're keeping their voice where it needs to be. If there's a huge absence of purple, that's something they're going to need to work on in, in my word study academy. So the other thing too is bit by bit as I go through this, students are leaving themselves notes in the in the um in the in the margin so that we can have a conversation. That's one thing in traditional grading methods that does not work. It's not conversational. There's no dialogue. It's us talking in a monologue in a vacuum to the student and they're not even listening to us. So at the end of the introduction We'll look at uh, things like the sentence constructs, the vocabulary, just like the template has, the declarative nature to the, declar the inverted nature. And I'll say, guys, in your margin, write me three sentences. What's going on? What's the good, the bad, the ugly with regards to your introduction? And out of the gate, how do you feel that you're doing? So in three sentences, they'll tell me exactly what's going on. And then I can respond to them when they, uh, when they submit it. So onus on the student. So here's another one. Let's take a look at your rhythm and flow. As we know, overusing the short, simple declarative sentence impedes this from happening. Underline each short, simple declarative sentence in your essay in orange. And then we have a conversation about where the orange should be. So I like declarative, the thesis statement to be declarative. So um, when you're arguing, you know, drop the hammer. So I tell them the thesis might want to be orange. And then in the conclusion of the syllogism, when you're really finishing up your argument and being assertive, there should be orange. But if you have a ton of orange in other places in your uh, essay, that's something you're going to need to work on. So get back into strunk and white and do some exercises to learn how to manipulate those 12 sentence constructs. So this really allows me to differentiate instruction as well and give kids uh, really focused goals to work on from revision, draft, to subsequent essay. So here's a couple of other things that we look at. To be verbs yield a super passive voice and also hamper your diction. Underline each to be verb that you used in your essay in black. So again, absence and presence of color. How much black do you have in there? Is that something you got to work on or are you good to go? And then even though I model and Bob Ross the heck out of things, students don't follow directions and it drives me nuts. And I'm sure it drives you nuts too. So I hold them accountable to the basics of the template. In the margin of your essay, write down how many sentences your syllogisms are. As we know, in order to have sufficient textual support and analysis, we need to have approximately 10 to 12 sentences. And you will have some Yahoo that tries to submit an essay with four sentence paragraphs that don't have any support analysis, no um, you know, governing argument in the topic sentences. And they'll try to submit that. And I'll just say to my kids, I don't want to see your essay uh, until you have a girthy paragraph. So I'm not going to take your four or five sentence body paragraph, follow directions and really work on it. And if you're having trouble, schedule a writing conference with me during one of your study blocks, lunch, or we have something called fifth period, which is op open access. So um, that's just a basic rule, you know? So is your introduction four sentences long? You know, I don't wanna see 11 sentence introductions. I don't wanna see one sentence introductions. I want it to adhere to the template for a reason. So here are a few other things. For rhetorical analysis and literary analysis, you need to front load your first premise with terms and or devices. Circle each mention of these features. So they're doing literary analysis, so they need to argue with their terms and devices. For a synthesis, you need to get to the why reason of your thesis, underlining green your argument. So they're going to have circles in green 
uh, in the first premise. Some students immediately launch into plot analysis and they forget that. They go, they go immediately to the second premise. So absence, presence of color, they'll see that um, they're going to need to revise or they're good to go. You need to paraphrase and quote sufficiently from the text sources in order to defend and prove your thesis. Underline in yellow all instances of textual support. So I tell them this is important, especially for synthesis, that you know you got you got to be you got to be weaving a few sources together. Otherwise, you're not synthesizing. The directions are use at least three sources, four or five sources. So let's make sure you're doing that. Um, again, absence, presence of color. Uh, for literary analysis, rhetorical analysis, I like to see a teeter-totter balance of paraphrase and quote so we can see to what extent uh, that is being balanced out uh, through the marking uh, of those things with a yellow crayon. And then last couple of things here. Smooth quote transitions are important to achieve flow and rhythm. Remember the five word rule, underline the words you've placed before your quote in brown. And I've gone over that five word rule in other videos, but it's just a, a little hack or a cheat code I have to ensure that students are embedding their quotes and that their quotes sound conversational uh, to avoid the quote dumping that we often see. So they can monitor on their own whether or not they're doing that correctly. You should hold off on offering textual support until the third or fourth sentence where the second premise begins so as to keep your argument central. In the margins of your paper, indicate the sentence by which you first offer direct textual support. I'm a stickler on this. I want three sentences for the first premise so that they can establish their argument for all expository modes. And in the fourth sentence, you begin your second premise. Even though that's a rule, I Bob Ross it. Uh, students just their their natural tendency is to get plot heavy so they can catch themselves on their own to see if they are falling into that trap and committing that snafu so that's just a few of the things we look at when we uh, uh, you know grade our, our papers in a, in a Bob Ross manner and uh, in the end here's what I do I wrote down on my notepad the grade I think they deserve so I give them this direction. In exactly five sentences, I want them to be thorough on this, right? And uh, really think about it. In exactly five sentences, I tell my students, tell me the grade you deserve and why. So we're going to see if we're aligned because grading often seems arbitrary. And I tell them that if we are within a five point margin of each other, and I'm talking like grades from 50 to 100, not rubric uh, scores. So uh, if we're within five points of each other, then I'll give you the higher grade. So if Peter says 88 and I said uh, 91, I'll give Peter the 91 because we're within five points. And very seldom do I have a big grade discrepancy. So the other day I did this with 58 AP language students and I had one grade discrepancy. I, I, this kid, he's a grade grubber, he's a grade monger, which we see in AP from time to time. Uh, I said like 83, I believe, and he said 98. And I just said, you're not, you're not self-appraising, honestly, you're not being reflective. So um, let's come in during open access and have a conversation about this. And it ultimately came down to this. My parents expect me to be in the high 90s. And I said, you know, Sajad, you're not, you know, so you're, you're, you're in the 80s. You're going to have to work harder, meet due dates, put forth more effort. And then those types of things will happen. But, you know, your grade is kind of matching your effort right now. So you're, I know your parents want you to be in the high 90s, but what do you want? Like, where do you want to be? Because you can't feel self-entitled to those grades if you're not putting in the work. So the big thing, and I have the picture of Sisyphus here, is that in traditional grading practices, we are the Sisyphus. We do 99.9% .9 of the lifting. In this exercise here, you can see that the students are doing more of the work, but here's the kicker. They're actually learning more about writing. So the last thing I have them do after they justify their grade is I tell them to write down three learning targets, three things that they're going to specifically do to revise or carry over to the next uh, essay that we do. 
So it's a student self-appraisal, uh, student self-grading, and we share the onus of responsibility. And I feel in this, they're probably doing 75 to 80% of the work and I can fly through these. When they submit, resubmit their paper, I'm going to look at their comments. I'm going to respond to them, and I agree or disagree with their uh, grade. And then if they're overlooking something in terms of um, learning targets, I'll redirect them and uh, say, you know, you need to focus on this. This is paramount. Um, make sure that's uh, that's happening. So uh, really good exercise, really good alternative grading practice. In terms of time, I can do it in one block. And again, I have 86 minutes uh, to do that. And then in terms of where you're at in the template, you set the criteria, you make your own rubric. And, um, you know, if you're working on quote transitions, embedding quotes, uh, sentence constructs, really have them focus on that. You don't need to do the totality of everything. So... All right, so we're at the end here. I will be doing free webinars through Perfection Learning uh, the first week of February. Uh, I'm going to do that, and then I'll probably do it a couple of other times throughout the year um, on my own through my own Facebook group, which is Teachers Making Better Writers. If you're not a part of that group, come join us. Um, I put a lot of things in there. So Perfection Learning and my Facebook group, I do free webinars. I'm also doing some work with the National Writing Project uh, in the coming months as well. And then many of you know that I am collaborating on a textbook with Tim Freitas, that awesome dude from the Garden of English who also posts a lot in these Facebook groups. And in order to help me write that book, I've created a course called the Teach It Right Five-Week Mastermind. So over a five-week course, I'm meeting with teachers uh, every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a period of five weeks, and I want super engaging, high-energy, high um, eager beaver teachers that are interested in taking my templates, my alternative grading practices, my Plato's Plato discussion, my gamified methods into their classroom and letting it rip and then they're going to um report back to me i'll over I'll, I'll look over their shoulder we'll collaborate together and make sure it's a smooth uh operation so if you're interested in um kind of revamping your room and doing some things differently you know revamping your instruction then definitely hit me up and uh, we could talk about whether or not you're a good fit for that uh, mastermind because there's a there's a certain type of teacher I want to work with for that. So uh, um, we'll, we'll touch base and see um, if you're right for me and I'm right for you. So if you want more information, you can email me at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. And there's more information about that mastermind at uh, www.teachinghowtowrite.com. So hopefully this is helpful. That was a very long explanation, but um, hopefully you can use it in your classroom and kind of mitigate uh, some of the grading burden that you have and uh, free up your evenings and weekends. But more importantly, watch your students grow and mature as writers because that's what it's all about. So take care for now. Happy teaching, happy writing, happy grading.